Psalm 19. I know this morning I didn't give the build-up for this psalm that I did last week where we were in Psalm 8, but this is a glorious psalm. They're all glorious, but uh, this is one that uh, I've enjoyed studying this week as well. As I said, we're going to break it up and um, look at it in at least two messages, probably just two. But I think I'll go ahead and read the whole psalm for us this afternoon, uh, and then we'll just be looking at the first six verses in the message. But follow along with me if you would. Psalm 19, verse 1 Uh, David writes, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end. There is nothing nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. But the words of my mouth... And the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So we look at these first six verses uh, this afternoon. I've got a very uh, basic title for what I think is being displayed for us here, and that is just general revelation. General revelation. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, thank you again for the privileges that we have had to uh, be gathered here. A church gathered is a special thing. Uh, it's a special time. I've been reminded of that in a book I've been reading this past week, Father, as you know, and you've just touched my heart with many of the passages and many of the uh, thoughts that have been brought forth about what it really means to gather corporately and to worship you uh, with, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's been, it's been a glorious day today. It's been precious and it's been a blessing uh, to me and I hope to many others. But Father, most of all, we hope it was glorifying to you and that you truly uh, were rightly represented in all things and that our focus was brought to you, our attention was brought to you. And when we get our minds and our thoughts off of ourselves and place them on you, Lord, it changes everything. And I pray this afternoon as we conclude this worship day with this time of, of looking to your word and we look at this portion of this psalm, I pray that you would just challenge and encourage us with the way that we find here depicted and that you have uh, revealed yourself to all of humanity. Uh, And may we reflect on that for a few moments and just let it resonate in our hearts. And and I trust, come away rejoicing and praising you and thanking you for this reality. Uh, Lord, again, we want you to be honored and glorified. So we pray your spirit would take control of all things. And we ask this in in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I really think if this psalm only contained these first six verses that we'll look at this afternoon, it'd be a glorious psalm. And contrastly, if it only contained verses 7 through 10, it would be a glorious psalm uh, because of the truth that's contained there. But obviously this psalm has this, these two parts together, plus it has an added section of what we might look at as application or testimony by the psalmist of what these two realities have meant in his life. So it it does make it a, a really important and helpful psalm. C.S. Lewis once wrote of the 19th Psalm, he said, it is the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. But what makes this psalm so great? It is great poetry. It's great poetry even reading it in English. I can only imagine what it must sound like or what it must have sounded like for the Hebrews to sing it in their native tongue do you, ever, do you ever find yourself wondering what that would be like? I, I bet it would be beautiful. Um, 
some of these psalms, you know, we, we don't see it in English, but we realize the way they were written, they were written so carefully, you know, starting each, each phrase with the, a common letter or a certain rhyme or a cadence that goes with it that maybe gets lost in our English Bibles, but would have been there in the tongue in which it was originally written. It, I'm sure it was a beautiful psalm. It has great language, as we will be able to tell as we go forward. But I don't know if any of those are the reasons why we should consider Psalm 19 a great psalm. I think Psalm 19 is a great psalm because of its subject. And it reminds us of how God has chosen to reveal himself unto us. A portion of this psalm, the portion that we will look at this afternoon, reveals to us at least some of the ways that God has chosen to reveal himself through what we might call general revelation. That's a term that's typically given to the way in which God has uh, manifested himself unto us, either through uh, nature itself or through the creation. The second portion of the psalm that we'll look at next week, Lord willing, is what we might call the truth concerning God's special revelation. And special revelation would be the term that's used to describe God's revelation through either the oral uh, spoken word through one of his prophets that he delivered to his people or the written word and certainly what we have in our hands today, the Holy Scriptures. This revelation is special for many reasons, but I think the, the main reason we give it that term is because of its limited scope. God has not chosen to speak to all peoples at all times through the revelation of the Holy Scriptures. But for those who have received such revelation, it truly is amazing, and it is something that we certainly should rejoice over. General revelation, we will find, is sufficient for its purpose, but it is not capable of revealing some of the more important details concerning God's person or God's purposes. It is only through special revelation that some of these important details concerning God and His ways can actually be made known unto man. Now, our author here is, is David. He's written many of the Psalms, obviously. And he doesn't tell us, but from what he writes here, it does not appear to me that he is seeking to say everything that could possibly be said concerning either general or special revelation. Rather, I think David appears to be simply rejoicing over the reality of their existence. This Psalm will reveal important truths to, a, to concerning God's general and his special revelation. But mostly, I believe David's recorded these thoughts in order to encourage the people to praise God for the way in which he has revealed himself unto man. As he begins this section on the general revelation, he begins with a declaration, if you will. And in verse 1, he says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. It would appear as if David and the other psalmists spent a lot of their time contemplating the skies. If you were with us last week, as we looked at Psalm 8, David wrote this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? In Psalm 33, we read this, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalm 136, we read this. To him who alone does great wonders for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens for his mercy endures forever. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 147 we read, He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. In Psalm 148, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass 
away. These are just a few of the Psalms that refer to the heavens, that refer to the skies, that refer to the stars, that refer to the sun and to the moon. And as the psalmist contemplate the incredible reality of the heavens, it brings forth praise from their lips. It causes them to want to praise the Lord. And this is exactly what David says in our psalm this afternoon. In verse 1, again, the heavens declare the glory of God, he says. And the firmament, the skies, the vast expanse which is above the earth, it shows forth God's handiwork. By observing the heavens, David says, maybe he wrote this or penned this, or at least the thoughts came to him as he's laying out uh, on the ground, looking up at the, at the heavens. He says, when we observe the heavens, we see God's glory being displayed. When we examine the firmament, we see the very handiwork of our God. The heavens are an example of God's general revelation of himself. In other words, the magnificence of the created heavens is such so that no right-thinking individual could view it and come to any other conclusion than this must have been created by an incredible being. But I did say (laughs) right-thinking. And while we would like to think that most people are right-thinking, the testimony of Scripture would lead us to think otherwise. The reality is the Bible tells us that the vast majority choose not to think this way. You keep your finger here in Psalm 19 and go over with me to Romans chapter 1. Let's just read that very familiar but important passage that reminds us of this reality. It's been a long time ago in our study on Romans on Sunday morning when we were there, but remember that this was one of Paul's opening statements as he began to lay the groundwork for the necessity of the gospel by looking at the sinfulness of men. And as he reflected upon man's sinfulness... He says this, beginning in verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. How has he done this? Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed beasts, four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Mankind doesn't miss the creator in creation because he can clearly be seen or he doesn't miss him because he cannot be clearly seen. No, the testimony of Scripture here, Paul writing under the inspiration of of the Holy Spirit, says this, God has revealed himself to every man clearly. And he has done it so clearly that man can, every man, every human being living on the planet can understand his eternal power and Godhead. And it is so clearly manifested to them that God holds all of them accountable. There is no excuse they have for not understanding or accepting or thanking or honoring with their lives this great creator God, because he has so clearly manifested himself unto everyone. The rebellion, the sinfulness of mankind, Paul tells us, does understand there is a God. He knows he's there. He's aware of he's there, but he purposefully rejects him. And in return, he often, ironically... (laughs) chooses to make the creation itself his God. Or he makes gods of his own handiwork out of created things, all in a purposeful refusal to acknowledge the truth that creation reveals concerning God. Some might question such bold proclamations, and I suppose it's everyone's prerogative to believe what they will as far as how much man does and does not understand about God. But I would ask us to consider, as we come back to Psalm 19, what the psalmist goes on to say about this general revelation, which I think, again, adds credence to Paul's point that, yes, every man does clearly have an indication of who God is, and they really are without excuse. 
Let's look at some of the things he goes on to say back in Psalm chapter 19. I think the first thing that we see here is we find out that God's general revelation is continuous. It is continuous. Verse 2, we read this. Day unto day utters speech, and this is obviously reflecting back to the heavens declaring the glory of God and the firmament His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. It's an amazing declaration that David makes here. Day unto day, David says, in other words, there isn't a day. There never has been a day that the heavens are not or were not uttering its speech concerning God. And night unto night, David declares, I know where there never has been a night that the firmament, this vast expanse that we maybe call the heavens or the universe or whatever, has not shown the handiwork of God and thus helped all those who viewed it to realize this has to be something that God himself has created. You know, while general revelation is not the same as special revelation, and while in many ways one can honestly declare that general limitation, our general revelation is limited, it can't provide for us the, the same things that special revelation can, I would say this tonight, there is a way in which general revelation actually exceeds special revelation, and that is the fact that it endures. It endures. God did not choose to speak audibly or through writing to all peoples at all times. In fact, I think if we were honest with the, history, the record of human history, far more of human history has been devoid of God's special revelation than the time periods in which it has received it. Even those who graciously have received God's special revelation, and we know that this is limited primarily to the Israel of the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament, even those have gone through significant periods of time when God has not continued to speak. In fact, we're in one of those times right now. God is not speaking. He's spoken, yes, but he's not continuing to speak to us. But the psalmist here informs us that there has never been a day, there has never been a night in human history when the revelation of the heavens and the firmament has not been declaring God's glory and his handiwork. Rebellious men throughout centuries have attempted to justify their godlessness by exclaiming, what? How can I believe in a God that's never revealed himself unto me? How can I believe there's a God? He's never spoken to me. Have you ever, when you're out witnessing and you've run into one of these kind of individuals, had them say, well, if God would just give me some evidence that he actually exists... I would believe. And sometimes we get back on our hind feet. It's like, oh, what do I say to that? God's not going to show you. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to disbelieve in faith. No, they're liars. They're perverse liars. They would not believe in God if he would just reveal himself unto them because he's been revealing himself to them every day of their lives. And they still refuse to believe. And we, we can know this and we can confidently affirm that because of the word of God. And David here declares to us that God's general revelation is continuous. It continues on. It never has not been there as an ongoing testimony to the greatness and the goodness of our God. There's a second thing that I think we find David saying here about general revelation, and that's that it's abundant. Again, verse 2, day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. The word translated utters here uh, in the New King James, and I'm not sure what the King James had there. I think it might have been uttereth too, so the same concept. It's the Hebrew word deba, and it literally means to gush forth, to bubble out, if you will, to spew forth. I kind of think the ESV captures it better in their English translation when they write this verse, day to day pours out speech, night to night reveals knowledge. In other words, David is telling us this. God has not been stingy with his revelation. He has poured it out in abundance upon all men. And when you stop and think about that reality, that has some serious implications in at least two ways, I think. First, we could say this. Every part of God's creation is uttering speech. Every part. There is not any part of God's creation that is not pouring forth the same knowledge concerning God the Creator. And this is beautiful. Because you don't have to live near an ocean in order to understand that God is the Creator. Good thing, since living here in Missouri, we're not close to one. But you don't also have to live in a desert to understand that God is the Creator. 
You don't have to live on top of a mountain to be able to see in creation your creator. Or deep within a great forest in order to understand God is the creator. No, every portion of God's creation screams out the reality of his existence. In fact, a man could be stuck in a cell somewhere with no windows, no ability to see anything outside of his cell, and he would have everything that he needs to know that there's a God by simply just looking at his own body. Because the creation of, of his human body is so amazing that it screams out, God, God is here. I have made you. You are special and unique. In addition to this, God's glory and his power is displayed, and this is wonderful and it's beautiful, it's displayed on the very surface. Aren't you thankful you don't have to have specialized equipment and you don't have to have specialized training in order to see and understand the revelation of God? God has literally placed it in front of our faces so that we cannot possibly miss it. In fact, what if somebody was blind? Then they can't see it. And that's true. But can they hear it? Can they taste it? Can they feel it? I think even if we lose one or maybe several of our senses, we still have the capability of coming to understand who God is through the creation that's all around us. Because God's purpose is for us to understand these things. Secondly, the abundance of God's revelation, though, is more emphatically heard and more emphatically seen the deeper one does inquire into the creation. James Boyce in his commentary wrote this, the existence of a creator is not a facile but erroneous judgment naively made by the uneducated. A judgment quickly disproved as one, soon as one looks into the evidence carefully. On the contrary, he writes, the more one looks, the more the heavens gush forth knowledge. There are scientists, we know this in our world, that emphatically deny the existence of God. But this is not because their observations or because their experimentations have proved that God does not exist. No, the reality is this. The deeper that they explore the creation, the more magnificent the creation becomes. Exploration and study doesn't point less and less toward an infinite being who created all things in an incredibly specific fashion. Exploration and study actually demands it. Those who truly search creation out can never come away more convinced that there is no God, for the, one, the more one looks, the more one sees of him. Robert Jastrow wrote in his book, God and Astronomers, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> That's a great statement. He's basically saying those who have chosen to take God at his word, we, you know, the Christians, those who have read the Bible and choose to take it at his word, concerning the fact that God is the creator of all things, never find themselves forced or faced with something that makes them change their minds. But rather, it is those who, through their scientific experimentation, have gone out of their way to somehow attempt to disprove there is a God, who ultimately find themselves humbled and acknowledging that he must exist. We all know that there are many who, in their rebelliousness, hold on to their folly even in the face of scientific proof to the otherwise. But one day, we know this, they will all be forced to admit that they were wrong, and that God is real, and that he is true. So general revelation is continuous, General revelation is abundant. I think we could also say this, according to our psalm, general revelation is universal. Verse 3, it says, There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The psalmist appears to be saying that the way in which God has chosen to reveal truth concerning himself to mankind is in a fashion every person and every people group can understand. Again, this is different than special revelation. In special revelation, God often only spoke to one person or one people group. And when he spoke to them, he usually spoke in their native tongue. If you were not an individual who was graciously 
able to receive the prophecy yourself, or if the prophecy was given in a language other than your own, it actually was impossible on the surface for you to receive God's special revelation unless someone graciously shared it with you or translated it into your tongue. This is one of the reasons why as Christians we are so adamant that work be done, that the Bible be translated into people's heart languages. Why? Because we want everybody to be able to understand what God has said. And we know that they can if it's not given to them in a language that they can understand. But general revelation, David tells us, is not like this. It is actually universal. There is no language group where this revelation cannot be heard. There is no place where someone might live on this planet where they wouldn't be able to receive God's general revelation. How beautiful is that? How wonderful is that? I think that's what the psalmist is saying in these verses. But there are those who say, wait a minute, that's not really the way the Hebrew should be understood. They say, actually, we should translate verse 3 without the supplied words that we have in our English Bibles here. And doing that, it's basically saying this, no speech, nor language, their voice, the voice of general revelation, is not heard. Interpreting the passage this way, in other words, is saying general revelation is not like special revelation. It does not come to us in a spoken or a written form. And if these individuals are correct in their, their interpretation of this text, the truth David is trying to get across by writing it doesn't change at all. Even if general revelation is not spoken or written, it still, David says, goes throughout the entire earth. And its message still goes forth to the end of the world. And perhaps if that's the proper interpretation, if David is saying, you know, it's interesting, general revelation isn't written, it's not spoken, it's not heard like, like special revelation is, but it's still impacts everybody. That even makes the truth even more amazing. <laughs> that God has chosen to reveal himself to people in a fashion where he doesn't even have to speak and he doesn't have to have it written and nobody has to go forth proclaiming it because it's just self-evident. Every person who he has brought into this world is confronted with the fact that God is here. <laughs> He's created them and they're accountable to him and they need to glorify him with their lives. David then, I think, it appears, is trying to maybe illustrate what he means by using the sun as an illustration. And in the end of verse 4, he says this, In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, in the heavens, all right, in the, in the firmament. He has set a tabernacle for the sun, verse 5, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. David chooses to finish his praise of God's general revelation by drawing our attention to some lessons, he says, that we can learn by just observing the sun. God, David says, has made the heavens a tabernacle, a tent, if you will, a dwelling place for the sun. Now, apparently, David is speaking to the fact that the sun seemingly, when one stands on earth looking at it and observing it, that it seemingly goes into a tent, and then later on it comes out again. Every morning, David says, I observe that the sun emerges out of its tabernacle. And every evening, without fail, David says, I've observed it, it returns and descends back into that tabernacle once again. Now, we, in our day and age, having been given the privilege of understanding some things and through scientific advancement, we've been able to view things and see things and have a greater understanding of what's happening. We understand that this observable concept of the sun rising and setting, the sun coming into, a, into view and going out of view is actually the result of the revolution of the earth around the sun as well as this rotation on its axis. But yet, how amazing that something so huge, <laughs> something so bright as the sun could become completely engulfed in the darkness of the tenth of night. I do find that fascinating. I know nothing about astronomy or anything else, but it amazes me that something like the sun, that when they tell us how hot it is and, and how bright it is and all these kind of things, how could it ever be the point where it's dark? It seems like it should always be light. And maybe there is some residual light that we are experiencing from it. I don't know. But from David's vantage point, he's just sitting there saying it comes out every morning and it disappears every night. The sun, David says, come forth each morning with a renewed energy. This is something fascinating, apparently, David as well. And a renewed intensity, verse 5, it says, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run his race. 
David says, when I think, and I look at the sun and what, what it does, he says, it reminds me of an eager bridegroom <laughs> leaving his house to go and receive his, his bride and bring her to his home. We can only anticipate how anxious and how energetic and how lively this bridegroom is as he attempts to go do this. David says, it reminds me of a strong athlete bursting forth from the starting line as he embarks upon a race. Again, man has been able to gain additional knowledge that helps us better understand the earth's relationship to the sun, why it seemingly appears each morning and seemingly disappears each evening. But does our additional scientific knowledge make David's point any less true? Or does it make it any less significant? Who caused this amazing sun to come into existence in the first place? Who placed the planets in their perfect orbits around the sun? And especially with respect to the earth, who was it that picked the perfect distance at which the earth would remain in orbit around the sun? And who initially established and now continues to sustain the exact temperatures of the sun so that we who live upon the earth do not freeze on the one side or burn up on the other? Day after day, the psalmist reminds us, the sun continues to appear and it continues to disappear. It continues to provide us with all that we need for our survival. The sun, David says, impacts everything and every one, verse 6. It is rising, its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its there is no one or no thing that is not impacted by the sun. There is no one or no thing that can escape the heat of the sun. There is no one or no thing that is not seeing God's glory displayed unto them every day as they live in the reality of the wonder of God's created sun. And that is just one Tiny, when you think of it in the vast scope of creation, one tiny piece, one tiny speck of God's vast creation. And yet this one tiny speck, David says, impacts every person. And it impacts everything. And it continually screams God. God, God, God. To God be the glory. There are some who read this psalm and they say, see, the Jews and the Christians, they're no different than all the other religious people in the world grasping for some meaning to life. They all, like others, worship the creation and worship the universe. But to say such a thing based on a psalm like this is, obviously intellectually dishonest. David is clear. The heavens don't display their own glory. <laughs> the heavens display the glory of God. And the firmament that David was observing did not display its own handiwork. The firmament was displaying the handiwork of its creator, God. The Bible is not calling here for Jews or Christians to worship the creation. It is actually calling upon them to do the exact opposite. The Bible is calling our attention to the magnificent creation in order that it might prove the existence of its incredible creator. The creation in never ceasing fashion continually screams out there is a creator and this creator is Lord over all of his creation. The creation continually points man, even sinful man, to his creator and in doing so condemns any man who refuses to acknowledge the creator and to live in thankful obedience to him. You know, it's interesting. We know how vital it is to bring the gospel to every creature. We understand it from its purpose sake, but it's certainly important for us because the master commanded us to take it to everybody. But isn't it interesting? It isn't a lack of hearing the gospel that is enough to send somebody to hell. All it takes to send somebody to hell is to exist in this creation and not acknowledge its creator. They're without excuse. I'm not saying general revelation is enough to save somebody. But the Bible's clear it's enough to condemn them. 
Because no man could stand before God and say, I just didn't know. I just didn't understand. I just couldn't comprehend. God, you know my science teacher told me this. This creation is so incredible. It shouts down every scientist or science teacher or other proponent of false garbage. I'm all for getting false teaching out of our schools and everything else, but the reality is, God says, I've already declared. People aren't going to hell because they're ignorant. People are going to hell because they're sinfully rebellious. God has displayed himself to them clearly, and they continue to say, I refuse to acknowledge God. But this general revelation, it's abundant. It's continuous. It's full. It's all we need. As we think upon it, we should be like the psalmist, and we should praise God because of his creation. Obviously, in one sense, we should praise him because it's given us life and existence. We're here because God chose to create. But more than this, we should praise him because it continually reminds us how incredible he is. A God that could create this is an incredible God, worthy of all of our praise. This is what general revelation is meant to do in our lives. Father, I thank you for the truth of this psalm. I thank you for what David uh, chose to uh, pen so many years ago. And obviously he was writing this in a song, so his expectation and hope was that the Israelites would continue to sing this truth to themselves and be reminded of this truth over and over again. And Father, I just uh, thank you for it, and I pray that, Father, you would use it in our lives uh, tonight. I would hope the vast majority of us, not all of us in this room, have come to understand uh, your reality and have even... Uh, found redemption through Christ. So these verses should just be a continual affirmation of what we already believe and, and stand in awe of. But Father, may we just, as we think about how you have chosen to reveal yourself, Lord, may we be so thankful for your incredible grace and mercy. And uh, Lord, may we point others to it as we spend time with those who do not know the Lord, that we point out this incredible creation and and ask them probing questions. How is it that this came into existence? How is it possible that these things could be? Who is behind all of this? What is his name? How do we know him? What are his expectations? Lord, may we allow this incredible general revelation to move us to the point of sharing the gospel with others and uh, helping them to see what you've also declared in the special revelation concerning the redemption through Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word, Lord. Use it in our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.